Yeah, kid! Welcome, welcome <laughs> back to the new and improved virtual COVID safe, secure, germ-free Handsome Home Buyer Podcast. My name is Charles, a.k.a. The Handsome Home Buyer, a.k.a. Captain Permit, a.k.a. Long Island's number one fix and flip investor, recently graduated from NYU with a master's in real estate development. What, what? In the process of being Long Island's number one developer, taking over. But ladies and gentlemen out there, they also know who has already taken over, but who is going to continue to take over, and that is Captain Permit. 516-513-883. And if you need plans, if you need permits, you need anything permit-related from coast to coast, from the Nassau-Queens border out to the tippity-tip of Long Island, we got you. The towns are getting crazier by the day. Town of Hempstead just came out three days ago and said, yo, we used to not care about egress windows and basements. This is good for you to know, man. We used to not care about egress windows and basements. Now you need an egress window in every basement. We're not going to legalize it. You got to know the ins and the outs. I've gotten in trouble more than any other person in the history of house flipping in, and development in Long Island. So if anybody knows, leverage my knowledge, my pain, and my hundreds of thousands of dollars of wasted funds being tortured by the building department. Obviously, I'm the handsome home buyer. If you have a house that smells like cat pee, is dated from the 1960s, has six inches of mold on the wall, human waste flowing past the basement steps, toxic gas stations, land for commercial development. I don't give a shit what it is. If it's land, if it's real estate, if it can be purchased, I want to buy it. 516-777. Sold. All right. We got a banger of a podcast today. I don't know if this is being recorded, if it's working, who's seeing it, who's not, but I'm having a good time. Our <laughs> guest is looking at me like I am completely out of my goddamn mind, and he might not be wrong. All right. I recently met this gentleman. He was kind enough to get involved and sponsor the Long Island Real Estate Revolution, which was an unbelievable event that was supposed to be at the Tilla Center live, but ended up being virtual and having an even greater impact, in my opinion. We had almost 10,000 unique views on April 19th. He got up there in a panel and basically dropped massive knowledge on the private lending space, institutional lenders, how they are, how his company, Share Estates, is using technology um, and integrating that into the private money space to essentially be the premier lender out there. Michael Raman, the Slammin' Raman, a.k.a. Michael Lodowitz. <laughs> did I leave How's it going? Did, did I leave anything out? I think you got everything. Long words. I, I got to find... I got to find something with handsome and loan in there also, but well, have, have, you, have you ever had an introduction that went anywhere near that? I think, I think that's it. That's, that's the way I went I, I had it actually in, in high school during the school fashion show. My last name is actually pronounced for but no one ever did that except for whoever was announcing something. And he started calling me the machine Ramin and that stuck for like three years. There you go. Other than that, it, it turned into slamming from ramen noodles, slamming ramen, uh, went into all that. And then our marketing team started getting creative with different names, and they ended up liking Mike Lonowitz um, <laughs> on Instagram. So I love it. Well, you they have started that during this whole quarantine, and we created the page. I think they took my picture and put glasses on it, and that was it. So if anybody's watching this thing in the comments section, I want to know which you prefer. Do you prefer Slam and Ramen? Do you prefer Lonowitz? I think Mike wants to know also. This is good. This is good R&D. So listen, bro, normally people get you on the, their podcast or they have you speak at an event and they, they want to delve right in to, you know, loans, programs, LTVs, how much are you going to charge me? I don't want to know any of that right now. I want to delve deep and I want to peel back the layers that is the slam and ram, and I want to know where you came from, where the upbringing is, how'd you get into loans? I want the goods, man. All right, you got it. <laughs> we got someone made the comment there on Facebook. Um, so started, actually grew up in Roslyn and still live in Roslyn. So the whole process, and I work with my partners that are all from Roslyn also. So it's a whole little Roslyn crew, um, you know, all the way from elementary school through high school, moved to the city during college, and then moved back to Roslyn after I got married. Um, so Roslyn guys through and through. 
I actually worked before uh, Share States. I worked at two other companies. So I started after college with the MTA, actually. So the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Really? I used to, yeah, I used to manage all the real estate. So. No. Well, where yeah. did you go to college? I went to Baruch uh, in Manhattan. So. Were you a cap- major, Were you a major in real estate there? Yeah, I did the capstone program over there, real estate and metro development. No so, shit. That was a master's program or an undergrad program? They had an undergrad program was when I was there. So school of public affairs. So wow. they had a BS in in that. So and a whole bunch of the guys that graduated from my class, they ended up going to uh, I think it was Corn was it Cornell or it was somewhere I, I guess in Manhattan. Um, and they, they ended up doing a master's program in real estate also, similar to the program you just completed. Wait, so let me ask you this question, because now I'm very curious. How did you know or at what point? Because you know, I mean, listen, I didn't realize I wanted to do real estate until I was like in my 30s. You knew that you wanted to do real estate from a very young age. How did you know that? Uh, very big area within, I guess, the community I grew up. My father used to build homes, so single family luxury homes in like Roslyn Heights. And then before that, he did a lot of construction in the city. So a lot of the guys in the garment district and other places building out showrooms, storage uh, within their, you know, within their spaces and offices. So okay. I started with all that, did high end renovations to my father um, and then got into that. I, I wanted to go another path. I did building management also when I was in college. And then when I graduated college, uh, I got the job there. Believe it or not, the MTA is the largest landowner in New York state. No oh, sure. So anywhere there's a railroad track, the railroad stations, uh, God knows what it is. They they own the property that it's on. So they have massive uh, lease agreements. So with all the pole pipe and wire agreements, um, you have the train stations, you have areas like Grand Central. Penn Station is actually owned by uh, Amtrak and leased to Long Island Railroad. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stations that you find out throughout. It. They're, they're all typically owned by it. And either there's triple nets to like if you're on Metro North. There's a Starbucks in the station. It's a triple net from Starbucks. They maintain the station for Metro North. They still own it. They pay leases, et cetera. So did your father do any kind of spec building or he was essentially like a, a retail contractor? So someone would come to him and say, yo, I bought this land. I want to build a house for my family. Is that what he would do or was he on the investment side? Both. So he worked with oh. investors and built for them. And then he did a lot of the just the calling for people going up. We want to add a, add a room to my house. We want to add a floor. So it was a mix. Hmm. So yeah. you go to college, you wild out in Baruch. <laughs> wild out of Baruch. Yeah. That was like, that was, that was another life. That was, that was just, you know, you were, you were a wild man, bottle service parties, but you, um, you knew you wanted to do real estate and then you start working for the MTA. And then what happened? One of my best friends growing up, they actually own a title company in Great Neck, so Atlantis National Services. And a lot of my friends worked in real estate. So he, he always said, why don't you get onto the title side and start selling titles? You have all your friends that buy buildings, refi, et cetera. He goes, you, you can make it work. So I actually ended up leaving the MTA, uh, you know, give them one day notice <laughs> uh, without knowing what the future is going to be. I j- jumped out of that and I got into actual title sales, so title insurance. Wow. Uh, started working on that end, started building the clients, meeting everyone, networking, um, bringing in the orders on that side. Anywhere from, you know, the smallest order I ever brought in, still remember, was a $34,000 title insurance refi in Florida. And the largest, I think it was about $120 million uh, purchase. So how do you, how old were you when you left the MTA versus when you went into the title business? Holy, how, how old? So you were you were at the MTA and you left the MTA to go into the title business at what age? That was seven years ago, so about uh, 29, 30. Okay, 29, 30. Okay. So, and you just, no plan, no nothing. You just, you know, basically grabbed your balls and jumped. You were like, I, I essentially, Pretty I guess nice. you weren't happy at the MTA? Uh, there's no for growth, really. It's very bureaucratic. Uh, that had a lot of change. I learned a lot, but uh, if you want to, similar to... I guess your experience and everything, you can either flip two homes a year, or you can go after 300 plus a year. It really depends on what you want to do with your life. So it just wasn't the, the space for me. Okay, so you get into the title business, you're literally crushing the life out of the title business, and then what happens? Um, so my partners, so 
on the share state side. So two of the owners from the title company, uh, Ray and Rodney Davuti, um, they had the idea for years of like a syndication platform. And now our CEO, Alan, was graduating from law school. So this was all about seven years ago. Um, Alan actually went to them and said, you know, guys, I love real estate. I love everything. I'm not so into title insurance, but I want to work with you guys. Do you have any other ideas you're working on? They gave him the idea of the syndication platform. He actually went on his own, uh, spent like a, a week and came back and said, you know, syndication is used to be the word. Now it's crowdfunding. So we actually created a crowdfunding platform from that. He came up with the idea. He came, they came up with several names, launched the platform and share states was born about seven years ago. Um, for when we initially launched share states, the whole concept and idea was to be an equity crowdfunding platform. And we actually started doing that. We actually started doing regulation A filings, which allowed non-accredited investors to get into investing in real estate. Um, but as we spoke to a lot of investors in our space, they, they all said, we love the concept. We love the idea, but we prefer to be on the debt side. So we started working with private families, uh, et cetera, and getting into the debt space and started closing, you know, hard money loans for investors. Um, so, on that end, so I want to stop, I want to stop you there for a second because I, I don't want to, this is a really big deal. So seven years ago, I remember when I heard about you guys, I initially heard, and I don't know if this is true, they're like, yeah, my, my buddy's like, listen, they essentially will loan you the money and then they go and they have a crowdfunding platform and then they they essentially source the, the, the money or get reimbursed through their crowdfunding platform. Like the use of tech, the way you guys did it seven years ago was pretty revolutionary. Like there wasn't a ton of people doing that stuff. This went from like, I know a guy who's like, the private money lending business went from, I know a guy who's kind of like a little Shylocky who's going to lend to me to, you know, you get more kind of institutional players, but you guys really led with this very cool crowdfunding s tech type of, of setup. So yeah. I kind of want you to delve in a little bit more into the time, how you guys came up with the idea, how it really worked, because that was, that was very, very cool. Even today, most of the hard money, lend, private money lenders that people deal with are, are not doing that. They're sourcing money from, Wall Street or whatever, and they're selling the paper, but they didn't do it. They didn't use technology the way you guys did, and they're not continuing to use technology the way you guys are. Yeah. So that was a big part of it was just in general. I, I think the banking world, unless it's your personal banking side, the, the loan world isn't much on technology. I think most places, if you still go to apply for a loan, they ask you to submit your documents via email or Dropbox, where we have it set up separately where you can go onto our platform. But I'll rewind back to that portion. So we did start share states, um, working with friends and family, um, you know, family offices, etc. And they started syndicating. We started syndicating the loans over there. Um, the way I got into it was I had all the contacts, I guess, from the title side. I really didn't know anything about loans seven years ago. So I mean, our obviously our application and our process changed throughout the years. But uh, two of my partners, they gave me a, a form. And they said this is our loan application. It was like one page. It had like five questions on it. And they're like, if you go to a couple of areas here, here, and here, there's a lot of speculators, flippers, developers, et cetera. So I went out there and met everyone and everyone just destroyed me. They were like, no, I don't want to do that. I want 100% financing. I'm not paying you 12%. Why are you different than everyone else? So I went back and I, we, we kept changing processes to make it something better than what, what people were getting back then. So I think the going rate seven years ago was 12, 13%, two points. And you would get between 70 and 100% of your financing, depending on who you went to, how many times you borrowed from him, uh, et cetera. So we figured to fall in somewhere between that. Uh, we did initially start at the 12 and 2 um, area. Um, after our friends and family were like, we love your concept, our originations far surpassed how much money our friends and family had. So we went the institutional route and we signed up our first fund that gave us $30 million. And that we probably put that out in like two to four weeks. Wow. And that went out pretty quick. Um, we had a great ratio on there. Um, everything worked on our initial uh, investments was uh, usually an experienced guys, 80% of their purchase, 80% of the rehab, not to exceed 65% of the future value. And that was seven years ago. I mean, obviously, as the years went on, that changed. Um, throughout the years, uh, share states in the last five, six years, we signed up, um, you know, over, I think it was like over $12 billion institutional capital to work with share states. Uh, we were closing between 70 and 100 million a month before COVID jumped in. Um, and 
we had our default rate was under 3% and we worked, wow. we worked with borrowers. So our whole concept was never loan to own. It was to help someone like loan for that guy to own either a block, uh, whatever their dream was. If you wanted to, if you can afford it and had the, the system set up, if you wanted to buy a block, if you wanted to buy a city, whatever your heart and you know passion was after. And we've helped certain people in certain areas in Jersey and Long Island where they're able to buy 50, 100 plus homes. And they could work on you know either exit strategy, whether it's the guy um, looking to do the simple fix and sell the property, simple fix, uh, rent, refinance and hold. We were doing the long-term loans as well. Uh, and then it grew into the guys doing heavy rehab ground up and prop projects as big as like a 19 unit townhomes on like the water in Philly, um, similar stuff like that on Long Island, uh, Queens, Brooklyn, stuff like that. Um, so, so the, I want how his company shares these oh, perfect. technology, right, um, and oh. integrating that. Sorry, bro. I lost you for a second. Little tech difficulties here. I'm not the most tech savvy, uh, tech savvy person. So the big thing that I heard in there, which I was going to actually ask you about, which I think is massive, especially given the, uh, I mean, this is a testament to how well you guys do your underwriting and how well you, you know, you work with borrowers and how well you, you vet these people. Because I remember when I saw you, you said that your defaults are under 3%, which is insane. Right. When I when I saw the leverage that was going on, when I saw over the last, you know, 12 to 24 months that people were at 90 percent purchase price, 100 percent reno, like interest rates were dropping, it was getting really, really crazy. And I started talking to other institutional lenders before I met you. And I was like, hey, listen, you know, what are your default rates? A lot of guys were talking about default rates in excess of, you know, 12 percent. So for you guys to be performing the way you are is is insane. So what do you like? What do you credit that to? Um, our underwriting team is there are certain things in this world of loans that people look at differently. You can verify certain. So certain lenders that will just look at credit. They won't look at your financials. They won't look at bank statements. Um, they won't verify your experience. So if you came in and told me at 700 credit, and you did five loans and you get five addresses. Some lenders might just take you for your word of that, which. In a perfect world, that would be great to operate like that. You know, I flip these five houses and look up the address is great. But we actually verify and create profiles for borrowers. So if you're just using, you know, handsome home buyer, Bob the Builder, whoever it is, if you came in, the whole concept and the idea of our technology was to create a profile for Charles. So Charles would sign up and before he became handsome home buyer in our system, he would be Charles. Um, they would ask your credit, and the whole idea was to build all that. So you have your you have your credit, then you have your track record. Then they verify your track record. So if you're in New York City, you can look it up on Acres, look at the signing, whoever signed the deed, make sure that you bought those five plus properties in however many years. Um, if it wasn't to look at the track record on Acres, there's other programs like DataTree. If it wasn't that, if it was, a, if it was a guy that's experienced, the biggest thing with real estate developers is their pride. So if you ask them uh, how many properties have you closed, they'll say 20, here's my list, here are the 20 deeds. This is exactly who I am, and this is who I this is what I did because to them that's the most important thing out there is their name and how they've done it. Um, so that's a big thing, and finding those guys uh, wasn't hard, and verifying it wasn't that hard either. But as competition grew, people would go out there and send out any sort of document, whatever it was. Um, same thing was most lenders would ask for bank statements. So you'd ask for three months bank statements. A lot of people wouldn't verify that. So we would actually call your bank or get a bank letter giving a number we can verify your funds that are actually there. So a lot of people were actually fudging bank statements, whether it was Photoshop, um, other stuff to say they had money they didn't have. So stuff like that mitigates a whole bunch of those issues. So let me ask you a question, because a lot of people, a lot of lenders out there are, are, are not you. They're just, they're looking to get money out the door because obviously they're not making money unless they're lending. They're looking for the points, they're looking for the fees, they're looking for the spread. How did, you know, how did so much due diligence in in an industry that I would argue has a lot of inexperienced investors in it? How did that affect your the amount of loans that you were doing? So did you do less? Did you do more? I, I'm sure we could have done more if we overlooked certain things. Um, but the concept is making your uh, investors feel comfortable to be able to raise the amount of capital, our capital markets and our CEO was able to do, if you show them like that 12 to 15% default rate, getting into the cheaper money, larger institutions, uh, it's not gonna work, uh, it's hard. And you have to show, you have to show your actual, they'll, they'll go through everything. So 
I, I think it's important to have all that information out there. Um, make sure it's clear. There are companies now that are third party companies for institutional investors to go to where you actually, instead of uploading on your own platform, like we have available. So like right now our borrowers are investors. If they have a, if they have a login to our portal, they can go see their whole portfolio. So if you're an investor that does whole loans, you can go in there and see your, your payments, what days they came through, um, what construction's up to, what percent of your draws are out. Um, so it shows them all those metrics. Uh, same thing for borrowers. Um, if you're someone who's borrowing for 10 houses a month, no one wants to cut 10 checks. So you put them on auto ACH, you can log into your account, see how much your draws are left. If you're computer, computer savvy, you can upload your lien waivers and your canceled receipts for your draws and schedule your draws through the platform, or you can just email our draws department. So the whole idea was to have all your information on there so you can look it up yourself. Um, we understood the life of a real estate investor also. You you work with a lot of rentals, right? So if you have your monthly mortgage payments, um, if they were due on your first, but you're getting most of your rents on the fifth, that's difficult for you, even though it's supposed to work in arrears. So with the 10 day grace period, we allow people to change it themselves. So if you owed money, um, you know, your tenants pays you on the first to the fifth, you'd set up your ACH for the seventh. So everything worked, you know, seamlessly for yourself and it made it easier on the investors. So you wouldn't have to go back and forth. Nah, super smart, man. I mean, super smart. Um, how, I mean, obviously, again, we talked about technology before. I want to talk more about the tech because that's that's really, A, I'm fascinated with the, with the tech aspect of it and B, I think that's kind of the future. I think yeah. the more friendly you can make it, the, you know, implementation of apps and things like that. I mean, there's a little bit of trust that 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 goes with that when dealing with the investors. So you need to know who you're dealing with. But I think the ability to, you know, take pictures and show progress and upload photos and things like that to be able to to get draws and, and smooth out that whole process, because that was I that was my biggest beef in the past. Like I've never really worked with um, institutional lenders. I typically raise private money, but the conversations I've had with other people before meeting you, the process was very cumbersome and annoying. And that to me was the biggest problem because a lot of people come to me and they're like, yo, I need to close in three days or five days or whatever it is, or, you know, a house is ready to close on the resale side. And I have people telling me it's going to take anywhere from two to three weeks to get a sat, a payoff and a sat because they're using some outside servicer. So kind of talk about, you know, what you guys have done with technology and what you're going to be doing going forward. I'd love to hear about it. Sure. So there's a mix of stuff. So you're talking about the application. So, the whole concept was to be able to get a repeat borrower funded within three to five days of when they put it. We've done fundings in one or two days, but the whole idea is if if handsome home buyer was logging on and he needed to close Friday, besides calling someone up and being able to explain their deal and say, hey, I have title and everything's ready, I need to close Friday. If you're a repeat borrower, you're, everything's in the system. So all you have to do, um, chances are we'll have your credit, we'll have your bank statements already, we'll have your experience. You just put in your new project, upload your entity docs, um, you'll get out a term sheet. You can e-sign it from there and we order your appraisal right away. So whether if it was an occupied property or if it was something where we could get inside to get you a better valuation than them assuming poor condition, they'd get you an appraisal back within 24 to 48 hours. Um, they would clear your file and send it to our bank attorneys and they would set up a closing with whichever side, you know, the, the seller, the bank, um, if it was a referee, whoever it was, our bank attorney would reach out and schedule your closing. Our bank attorneys were very fast and accommodating. So uh, I think that made the process easier also. Speaking about the other part, uh, that is a huge thing. One of the biggest things right now is a lot of institutional lenders, they require to use a third party servicer. 90% uh, of our bridge loans, they are serviced actually in-house. So if you do have a profile, you can log in and request your payoff yourself. So you can go in there, log in, request the payoff with your pay through date and you get it instantaneously. The whole idea was not to wait. Um, I've done it on my own homes, like selling and buying homes and getting a payoff for some people was a murder. Um, it was it was a painful process. So we wanted to find a way to make that easier. Um, we, we looked at other payoffs from other banks. So we're able to formulate, um, you know, a whole process and a look to the payoff that's similar to larger, you know, conventional banks and makes the process easier for anyone doing the math, reading them or confirming that is this correct. So the title company correct uh, confirm the numbers. Huh. Yeah. What do you what do you see going forward as far as as tech goes? Do you do you see that as being the future of the industry? Do you feel it, it as you know making things easier? Like, where do you feel the need is, the edges, the thing that is going to continue to help you guys grow and and be as big as you are or bigger? 
I definitely think the tech helps a lot. It speeds up a lot of the process. It speeds up a lot for the underwriters. Um, if we know you're in the system, you're not redoing the same process over and over. Uh, I do see other parts of it expanding, um, maybe where they'd be uh, an API out to like, a, you know, your exit lender. If you're doing a refinance and it transfers all your information from us to them. So if you're working with us and you know XYZ Bank also works with us, your information will be transferred over. So you don't have to resend everything. Everything's on there. Um, you do a lot of the rent alone. So I'm assuming you send verification of rent, verification of mortgage, stuff like that. If it's already in our system, your, your mortgage payments and you could print out a statement or a payoff or your invoice right there. Or if they're intertwined into our system and they can look it up with, you know, access granted by you. I think stuff like that speeds up your process even more, um, especially on a takeout loan. So we're working on other concepts like that within our tech. So let's talk about the last couple of months how it transitioned from just like complete and total chaos as far as, you know, just buying and selling to, to the world we are now. And I mean, you're, you're a major player in the lending space. So you guys currently are still lending. I know that, but literally overnight, a lot of other lenders that didn't have the same backing experience that you do literally disappeared. So yeah. Kind of talk about essentially the, the the dynamics of what went on in the market, why these guys disappeared, what's going on right now, and then what the future, i.e., like the next three months looks like from a lending sure. point. So the I guess the first side of it was it you're right, before this went down, it was crazy. Um, the fix and flip loans, the biggest thing was the non-QM. So the regular rental loans, we were doing non-QM rental loans in the fours, high fours, and that was a 30-year loan with like interest only. So your monthly payment was as an investor, was almost nothing. You were cashing out every month. Um, so those deals were great. People love them, especially on the, on the takeout. Um, and the, the the bridge loans and the rehab and the construction, I mean, those were, it went from people just doing fix and flips with small budgets, then going to larger budgets, then getting into like uh, adding square footage or adding units. So I, I think a lot of uh, the guys might be listening on, Brooklyn was like huge. People buy a three family, convert it to eight or 10 units. That rehab budget is probably twice your purchase price of your two family, but people became comfortable with that process as they as they see people finish those projects. So you saw people getting into that, and then ground up was becoming the next big thing. With a shortage of housing across the U.S., uh, I think people were buying lots for years. They were breaking them up. They were finally getting their entitlements done, and they wanted to borrow money to build 10, 15, 20, 30 homes at once because they knew there was a need for it. So the, the whole ground up industry was growing as well. And then coronavirus comes and within a week, everyone's like, go home and just work from home. And then a week into working from home, every institutional investor is like, we're putting a pause. So it didn't matter who it was, what it was. There's not any institutional investor within that first like week that didn't say, hold on, like what the hell is going on? So at that point, everything was put on pause. And that, that was a time where you had to be optimistic. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, the world's ending. And then the other half of the people were, you know what, it's just a little time out and everything will go back to normal. Um, a couple weeks after that, um, it was just like a quiet, like a little lull in that first month where everyone was still like not sure what was going on. Uh, and then you started seeing institutional investors slowly uh, come back or come back with terms as they saw numbers starting to come down, whether it was with uh, infections, deaths uh, and so on. And that gradually with the institutional side started growing a little bit more. But to go back, when you're saying a lot of people started dropping out, um, if their money side dropped out, so if they had a bank line to pre-fund the loan and sell it, or their institutional side pulled out and they didn't work off of spreads or servicing or any other side of the business, that kind of cut off how much money they were making. Um, and that, that probably took maybe some people out. I don't know the exact numbers of how many people were in the industry, how many are left. Uh, we did see large, um, large layoffs in this industry. And then another thing that caused the big problem was the margin calls. So a lot of the institutional investors had margin calls, uh, needed to show more liquidity and were selling their loans at a discount just to fill up their liquidity again. So, so explain, so, explain to people what margin calls are and exactly how these guys bought on, on margin and use margin to leverage. So, I mean, the whole process in general, uh, Exactly. They were using leverage uh, on it. They had to show a certain amount of liquidity or their portfolio was that. But as the value of the portfolio dropped, they had to show more liquidity. And yeah. essentially, it's, it's a hard number, especially if you're lending out a billion dollars a year to be able to show that money uh, in your bank. So, 
Uh, a lot of these guys ended up selling at a discount. Um, a lot of them, you saw their stocks drop if they were a public company. Um, but, you know, it, it looks like stuff is starting to come back now. Uh, people were able to work out certain programs, whether it's forbearance or for rent, et cetera. And hopefully a whole bunch of these companies will come back. These were all like cool guys you saw at conferences, events, you know, peers in the industry to help grow where it was. And, um, you know, so far it looks like it's for the most part on path to come back. Um, I wouldn't say as big as this industry got. I don't know if it's going to be at that point right away, but it's, it's, I think everything makes its return. I think 2008, 2009, is a good uh, is a good example. Everyone thought the world was ending. You'd never get a bank loan again. I mean, it came back, and through this pandemic, uh, people have been doing regular mortgages with lowest rates in the industry, and the technology is working for them to close without sitting at a table. So, yeah, yeah, no, that, everything cycles. But I'm curious to know, just for for my own selfishness, how <laughs> if you had a, if you had a crystal ball, how you see the next year going like in three month increments from a yeah. lending standpoint because i i i'm da i'm dancing on my desk right now like <laughs> i i am a happy man like literally as we're doing this podcast my phone is blowing up like sheer pandemonium i've seen three houses this morning already it's like freaking christmas and i'm the only one with money like it's it's like the world just went on sale and i'm the only one with money or one of the few people with money so i would yeah. really like this to continue a little while but I, I, I don't know. Because, you know, in my personal opinion, I don't think this is that bad. I, I really don't. Like, I get on the phone this morning with my boy Brian Carp, who was in the real estate revolution, killer who sold 205 houses last year. And he's like, bro, I'm blowing houses out. I myself yeah. have only one house that's market ready on the market that hasn't been sold. And it was sold. I just, um, the person got, the one of the co-signers got COVID and ended up in the ICU. But otherwise, I was fully sold out with a ton of products being renovated now. So, um, I mean, what do you think three, six, nine, 12 months is kind of like a progression of how lending guidelines tighten up from a, from your standpoint? So I think the next three to six months, at least you can keep dancing. Um, if you're worried about people coming back or <laughs> taking some of the properties that you're offering or bidding on, um, what I've seen is a lot of guys that were in contracts, a lot of property trying to either sell their contracts, get out of them, um, lose their down payments, etc. And there was the flip side, guys like you were like, if you have a contract, I'll take it. If you have the home, I'll take it, which I think is a good approach. You have uh, people that are like leaving cities. So you've got the boroughs, anywhere congested Manhattan, they are moving out and they'll take a home almost anywhere right now. Just to, I mean, I think we spoke about this on the phone before. If you lived on the 18th floor with two kids and you didn't leave for two months, you'd probably never want to be in that position again. So a lot yeah. of people are moving to suburbs or homes. Um, I think you're seeing a, the other big side of it also is a lot of businesses or companies like Twitter was one of them saying you can work from home going forward. Um, yeah. If you worked in Manhattan and you liked it because you didn't, you know, you didn't have to commute. If your company's now saying you don't have to come to work five days a week, you could come in too. You're fine with that commute. So you're going to see again that home market with you and Brian Carp speaking about like, hey, I'm just going to go buy that house because I don't have to travel as much. Uh, I think you're going to see that expanding. I think you're going to see people wanting their space. Um, I do think though, uh, another, another side that benefits you guys a lot also is all private lenders and institutional lenders and all that. They were letting people in for less, uh, with less experience or no experience at a lower leverage. That's all gone out the door right now. I don't know when that's going to come back. So if that's for another year that keeps out half the people that were thinking of becoming flippers or, um, they did one project with someone else, but they're going out on their own now. And they don't have that track record to get approved to get the financing and they don't have like uh, silent investors or anything else. Those guys also will be put on the sidelines for a bit until the institutional side feels comfortable, the job market's back um, and all that. So um, I think the next at least three to nine months, you're not going to see like, I don't see anyone offering to like the less experienced guys or no experience. I think one of the bigger things you're going to see now also is lenders that were requiring credit and liquidity are asking for those items now. So if you're an institutional lender or a platform like, uh, you know, originate to sell model like us, um, we do look at that stuff on underwriting. And I do think the other peers in the industry are looking at it now. So they're gonna wanna see credit 680 and higher when people are going down to the 500s and they're gonna wanna see liquidity. So they are gonna verify your bank statements now to make sure you have money to close and debt service, or they're gonna take interest reserves. So you don't have the capital to do any of that. That might keep you out of the market as well. 
Um, yeah. Just like anything else in any other loan program, that stuff does adjust. It just really depends on, I think, vaccine timing or treatment. Um, people getting back into jobs. I think hospitality industry is one of the biggest. And for the most part, it's been shut off. So you've, you've closed airlines, hotels, restaurants, nightclubs, uh, bars. And I think as that stuff comes back, you're going to see a big push again from the institutional side to get the homes up and built. Yeah, it's just it, everything cycles and, and it's a process. The one thing that's different about this, or I got to tell you, like, I'm not nervous about the single family housing market, you know, in the immediate future of now to like, let's see, three, three years. The things that scare the shit out of me, the more that I think about it is, A, I'm actually really worried about New York, period, because I love New York. I'm sure you love New York. New York is an amazing place for a couple of different reasons. A, you can make a lot of money. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of energy. You have a ton of opportunity because it's basically the center of the world. But when people start realizing that they can make New York money working from home in other places, New York becomes an expensive, dirty, cold place with freaking bums on the street with rotting legs everywhere. It is, and that's the thing I'm worried about because government is not in, has been basically chasing big business out of here for years. And I think they had the attitude like, fuck you, this is New York. You're going to pay because you need to be in New York, but you don't need to be in New York. Like I'll go as extreme as to say it wouldn't scare. It, it wouldn't surprise me if in 10 years from now they decided to move the stock exchange to a different state, like New York had lost its, its power. That's how nervous I am with, with the current trends and how, how politics has been working in New York. It, you might see there won't be enough stock exchange. People will all just trade from home, you know? <laughs> you, well, might, you might see the floor traders will be gone also. You never know. The stock exchange for me is just more of like a symbol, if anything. Like everything's done electronically, but the stock exchange is a symbol of this is New York. It's the financial capital of the country, if not the world. Yeah. But again, if all these big powerhouse companies and banks don't feel the need to be in New York because why do they? And all the employers are like, fuck it. I can go to South Carolina or I can go to Miami and I could chase hot Latin booty around and make big <laughs> New York money and not pay any state tax. Um, yeah. What the hell am I doing here? That um, is just the shit out of me. That I think it's going to happen. I, I, I do think though, just in general, as, as, as just human short term memory is a very big thing. I do think once there's a vaccine, everything kind of flows back to normal everyone goes back into their original routine. Um, that's the only thing. Like at the end of the day, you can say it about anything, but as when something's the best, it's the best. Like uh, everyone always makes comments about LeBron James, but no one talks about him leaving Cleveland the first time anymore because he's LeBron James. He, he, he's the best at what he does. And New York is the best. So people might leave it or be scared of it for a bit, but they're not going to not come back. Yeah. I mean, I guess we're going to have to see how it plays out. <laughs> I, I agree with you that people have short-term memories, but we're not talking about Taco Bell having like a botulism outbreak and then people forget about it six months later, but nobody eats there for six months. I'm talking about like real shifts in trends of the way people want to like live their life and stuff. So yeah, what but think, valid, valid point we're going to have to see, but that, that makes me nervous, man, because I got to tell you, I love New York. But if I didn't grow up here and I didn't have all the opportunity here, I, I really wouldn't be here because I hate the weather. It's really fucking expensive. And the politics is bananas. It is. But even now, I mean, a month, what is it, two months in? Uh, two months ago, people were in their balconies at 7 p.m. clapping. And now everyone's like telling them to stay at home and they're trying to fight to get into a bar. So it's, it's crazy, but they're, they're already back. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be interesting to, to see what happens. But... It's, I'm actually very surprised to see how many people are really nervous. Like how many investors are actually really nervous and they're just unloading everything. Like, you know, you and I had a conversation the other day about a couple properties and you were like, yo, this guy thinks doom and gloom. He thinks it's the world's coming to an end. Um, I guess nobody, nobody has a crystal ball. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. It's the, the biggest thing is everyone would keep asking, well, what do you think is going to happen? I'm like, I, I wish I knew. But this has never happened. It's very unpredictable. Um, I do think certain areas, uh, I guess, make stuff look worse or better than it seems. And I think with positive news and people doing the right thing, it'll go back sooner than later. Have yeah. you seen any kind of like 
in certain markets with certain asset classes or anything, have you seen kind of like the light at the end of the tunnel? Do you see certain investors coming with more product in certain markets? Do you see bigger discounts in other markets? Do you see everybody kind of like holding firm? What do you what do you see from your end right now? I think in at first people were scared, especially like a we were saying the single family like fix and flips in Long Island. And I think that fear went away when they saw that people like uh, I guess payoff requests were still coming in. So investors started getting money back like two weeks in and they're like, what is this guy paying with his own cash? I'm like, no, he sold the home. He sold the home. The guy's moving in and uh, banks are still closing. So if you have a job, uh, it's a non jumbo mortgage. You're closing in two weeks. So banks feel comfortable about that. There's the other side of it also. Um, at first, people were scared because they didn't know the banking guidelines. Um, so if people were furloughed and laid off, they felt they had to wait another 12 months or more um, for them to get their tax returns and jobs and W-2s up to date so they can get a mortgage. Um, after a pandemic, once you're back on payroll, they'll just go off of those numbers. So you'll be able to get a mortgage sooner than you would have in the past. So I think stuff like that makes people feel more comfortable that the houses that you're fixing and flipping or someone else's um, will have buyers as people go back to work right away. And I think people will take the advantage of the low rates. I think the Fed was saying that they don't anticipate the rates going up in 2021 either. So I think it's going to be a big year next year for purchases, um, purchases and refis. So if you own if you own the multifamily buildings in other states, I think garden style apartments became very popular in the South. Um, I think people are going to work on finishing this up and renting them out. There were great numbers over there. Yeah, no, I think. Um... It's gonna. It's it's interesting. This is the kind of thing that really changes lifestyle forever, and uh, I guess you have to be the kind of person that is is into change and is always looking for the next thing. Otherwise, you'll if you're paralyzed by it, you're you're just gonna sink. I mean, is there are there certain asset classes that you see that are really getting hit harder than other ones? Oh um, yeah, um, retail. Yeah, retail. We we never did loans on hospitality. Uh, but just speaking with a family friend who's an underwriter with a big bank, they put a pause on every hotel loan, even if it was clear to close, hold. Um, so I think those industries, until they get proof where people can go back, I, I think you're going to see a hold there. But at the end of the day, I think you're always going to still need your retail, whether it's the small shopping strip that's going to have uh, the pizza place, the Chinese takeout, the dry cleaner. People are still going to need that. I, I think they're going to come back just whether how comfortable people feel. And at the end of the day, I, I think it usually takes one one person to, you know, put their foot out and people are gonna start following them, feeling comfortable, just in anything else. So, you know, I, I went to the market and then the next person says, oh, we went to the market. He's alive two weeks later, I'm gonna go to the market. And it opens up, same thing with airplanes. People are on them now. Yeah, no, it's true, man, it's true. It's just like you said, everybody freaks out and then people forget. And then they're they're back to real life, which is what I think. I mean, I've basically been seeing people for the last month just go back to work. Like construction people were like, you know what? Screw this. We're just we're going back to work. Um, um, we've still been doing draws. A lot of people during this time, they actually finished their construction faster. Um, as long as it was Long Island, I guess, was easier. Jersey also. Five boroughs. A lot of the guys got the affordable housing permits. Yeah. And their contractors usually had you know, 20, 30 jobs going on when it's down to five affordable housing to have more people, their projects are flying. Yeah, no, that's true. We, uh, we never slowed down for a second. I motored through, even though we weren't supposed to, it's like, listen, people, they have to work. I understand it was a sensitive time, but you can't just, you can't just stop doing what you're doing. Cause at the end of the day, like everyone's been saying, th there's, there's no, there's no cure for this. There's nothing has really, for everything that's gone on, nothing has changed. So listen, Mike, you're the fucking man, as always. You too, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insight. You're a leader in the industry. You're a very smart guy. I love following you and seeing what you do and what you're going to do next. Um, how do people get in touch with you? And just so that you kind of really put it out there in depth as far as the type of programs and the type of people that you that you work with so that the public knows, hey, Mike's got a product for me. Let me go talk to him. They can follow, uh, they can, everyone can always email me or call my cell phone. Um, if I don't answer, I call back within half an hour. Um, they can follow our Instagram, Slam and Ramen. We got Mike Lonowitz also. You're missing an, you're missing an M in Slam and Ramen. Bro, ah, damn it. It's okay. <laughs> Close enough. We're watching it go down on the bottom. Um, email, and then I, I always encourage people to, um, you know, to, put their email on our website and get our weekly emails that shows recently funded there we um, go. and the programs. There we go. 
Um, but I, I think it's uh, I think it's important. I think those things are important. We follow what's going on in the industry, especially when you see recently funded and new programs. Also, like right now, we're also doing a five year rental program as opposed to a 30 year. The rates aren't where they used to be for the non QM, but still a great program. People are, are taking advantage of it. And I do think within the next 45 days, you will see stuff you're a lot happier with rate wise, fee wise and leverage wise within this industry. Bro, the first minute you get a 30 year rental refinance product, I want that call. I want to be you the get. first guy who's like, yo, because I have a ton of shit lined up, ready to refinance. I just it just you can't get it done right now. It's I will Instagram done. live you and add you to it in front of everyone. Yes, we need to do a deal, man. We definitely need to do a deal. I uh, I really appreciate it. Again, Got you're it. Fun, man. Always dropping knowledge. Always being 100 percent real. Always on the cutting edge. Um, until Thank next you, time. Man. Shout out to you and a congratulations again. If everyone can clap wherever they are in his new masters. I know it's not easy. Definitely not at NYU. So wishing you great success and luck. And when this is all over, we'll celebrate with a pint of ice cream and a bicycle ride. There you go, man. I love it. And obviously, I'm the handsome home buyer. So if anybody out there has a house that smells like cat pee, dated from the 1960s, land, commercial pro property, the worse it is, the better I like it. 516-777-SOLD. That's a wrap.